I mean, the actual strategy itself, and I always say this, if you have a great strategy, if this strategy is so good, automate it. Just mm -hmm. automate it. Tell me how good it is. Show it to me. I'll give you money. Mr. Crudelli, welcome to the channel. Thanks for stopping by. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, you're very, very welcome for having you. How has the day been going for you? Were you trading today? Yeah, a little crude oil. Not uh, not a little, not too much of ES, but a little bit of crude oil. Yeah. Now, are you more of a mean reversion type trader? So when we're in these trending type environments, not too interested? Or what was the decision to lay off the ES? I just, I just had stronger conviction today in crude. So that was just where my focus is. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I tell you, maybe by way of starting off here, just getting the conversation going, could, could you explain to us kind of what your uh, approach is to the market? I know you've had an awesome career, but maybe currently through to today, what is your approach to the market? Well, my approach is, well, I look at it in, in, in really, really three, I guess we'll call it pillars, investing, swing, day trading. Hmm. And so I really separate them across the board. You know, investing, I try to do a lot of obviously hands-off things that I like to keep for, you know, many years. You never want to cover a winner, uh, really. So that's just a, something I look at and, and I do a long-term plan for that. And that's stocks. I don't really trade much futures at all because I'm primarily a futures and options trader. More options these days, but I'm primarily futures trader. And so I don't do a ton of that in my long-term account, but I do a lot of it in my swing, and that's something I look for where I'm trying to look for, where I think I have the strongest conviction of a, it could be a mean reversion move or a move with the trend, like this move with crude oil that I was talking about today, that's with the trend. A lot of times they could be mean reversion too. I guess it just depends on the market environment. And those I try to sit on options. I'll use futures, even micro futures. And then I'll, you know, those I try to hold for anywhere between two and five days, really not holding swings much longer than that. And that's really where I've become probably most active, I guess, where I'm looking for those the most. Doesn't mean I'm trading that more than day trading, but I'm just doing that. That's where I really want to be because it fits my personality better now and just my lifestyle. I don't want to be day trading as much. But then the day trading is, you know, it's there when it's good, you know, and when it's not, it's not like right now in the S&P, we're kind of in a middle area for me. So I look at my day trading and I say, just be careful here because I think it's going to be a two-way tape and I don't have conviction to one side. And so I try to remove myself from doing that. Very good. Okay. So um, would be a lot to unpack there. Maybe we could focus a little bit more on the, let's say, day trading side of things. But for the day trading, are you exclusively futures or will you do options intraday? Oh, I do options intraday for sure. It's been a new challenge for me. I would definitely not classify myself as a professional options trader by any stretch. But I have been using options a lot more intraday. And it's really because it allows me to it's kind of that hybrid model where I want to be more of a swing trader. I don't want to be clicking the button active too much during the day. But when you get uh, into an options position, like for example, even today, I'm in a swing position in crude, but I'll use that as an example, even for a day trade, because I did tra day trade a little bit. I trade around the core position. You know, I wanted to buy crude this morning. I was long overnight from 86.80. I said, if it gets down to 86.40-ish, I want to start to buy it. So then I started to look into some options markets and I'm not very familiar, honestly, with crude oil options too much at all. Definitely more in the S&P. So I took some options that were pretty much right at the money and I traded them a little bit intraday. And when I bought them, uh, they allowed me to, to absorb the little bit of a sell-off that happened this morning. And then when they went my way, I just peeled them off. You know, versus if I would have been in the futures, I probably would have been, you know, turned out of them a little bit quicker than I wanted to. Uh, you know, I might have even taken some of the position off as a loss and then, you know, scratch some. And there's just a lot more activity. So I've tried to really use options as much as I can intraday. If I, if there's an area that I like that I feel might give me a little bit of, you know, back and forth. So I have a stronger hand in the market. Uh, and I've learned that even with options, sometimes if it sits there too long, it might go my way. And eventually I'm I'm losing money on it because <laughs> the decay, you know, so it's, it's a learning curve, but I've definitely been using options more intraday. Um, interesting. And do you feel that your, when you're having a trade idea, put it together, kind of doing it on the option side gives you less, you, you need to be less accurate with maybe the exact timing or the exact entry of it. It kind of gives it more room to let that trade idea work. Is that kind of part of the motivation or not really? 
Yeah, no, exactly. You know, because sometimes you're in areas where price matters a lot. And so you want to get it, you want to get on it, and you want to take it down, right? And you want, when it turns, you want to be in with a full position and the futures markets are perfect for that because you can, you know, it's a leveraged product anyway, you know, you could get in and when price really matters, futures are the best. But when you look at an area and you're like, look at crude oil just had a big rally. It's come off a little bit. I'm already long some futures. Do I want to step in here and keep adding to this position that's already a little bit against me? And it's not adding to a loser, although some may say that is because my stop was well below. I just didn't want to get too active in an area where I know that it could probably make me overactive and probably squeeze me out, whether it's a time issue, too much volatility. I just look at the market and say, you know what, maybe I can use an option here to still participate in the market in this direction without having to worry too much about the slippage. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's a tough part, especially about day trading. It's a uh... I had the right idea. I was just had the timing completely wrong. <laughs> um, exactly. Okay, so very good. Do you live in Chicago? I used to. I live in Florida now. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Yeah. What part of Florida? I'm in Naples, Florida. Oh, very nice. Um, now, would it be accurate to say that you started your whole trading journey on the uh, in, in Chicago on the floor? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I went to the exchange, CME group. Uh, which CME Group now it was Chicago Mercantile Exchange, still technically is, but uh, it's a lot bigger now with all the exchanges that are under CME Group umbrella. But yeah, I started down there 18, 19 years old. Mm. Okay. And so it's very interesting from my perspective because it was kind of an era gone by and uh, you know they're not making any not making any floor traders anymore. With your experience in getting started on the floor, was this something that was like a, a extremely difficult thing to get into where very few people obviously do it? Was it more of an interest, like very few people were committed to moving to Chicago and trying to do this? Or was it a, a really big time thing just to be able to get accepted or just be able to have that as a job? Well, I would say that really the, the floor was a revolving door of new people all the time. So I don't think it was that difficult to get on the floor. I got on the floor really without knowing anyone. I went down there through a classified ad and I didn't know anyone. So the path of getting in as a runner on, for a basic job was not that difficult. I mean, they didn't pay much for the, for the basic job. So it wasn't really something that was sought after. You know, I'm 18, 19 years old at that time. And I was making three, four bucks an hour, whatever it was. So it wasn't like you're going down there and getting rich. You know, I say going down there, it's, I say going downtown. I lived in the Western suburbs. And so the path of entry to get in was, I would say, relatively easy. I mean, you're going to take a, you're not going to get paid a lot, but to get to the next levels, well, yeah, that's that's a whole other story to become a really big ARB clerk and maybe like the Euro dollar options, which those guys make a, made a ton of money. I worked in that pit for a little bit, you know, or to become you know, even an, an, uh, a, a clerk for a broker, one of the big brokers in the S&P, that is not going to be an easy thing to do because those were really more careers for those people. You had to be down there for a while to really understand what they knew. And you develop that relationship with your broker, you know, if you're going to be a clerk to really, to earn that spot, you know, and then to become a broker or to become a independent trader like I became, Anyone can become an independent trader. You just had to go, you know, you had to get a background check. You had to go through membership. And that was just really more or less, are you a stand-up person? You know, did you uh, did you have any criminal backgrounds or do you have anything against you? To become a member was not that difficult. And so it's just a matter of making money in those positions, right? Like to become a broker, you needed to have business. You needed to be, if you were a phone broker, you needed a big client's uh, outside uh, of the Merck that called in and then you arbed them into the floor below, uh, to the pit broker. And then the pit broker, you know, how do you get that job? Well, you know what? You have to make a relationship <laughs> who, with a broker that's on the phone and hopefully they give you the business because you can go stand up there and then you're going to have a firm that sponsors you, gets you in there. I mean, so it gets tricky in that sense. And that's why you didn't really have a lot of turnover there. But on the bottom to get to the point of trying to get into that next level, yeah, you can get in. Mm, very interesting. Now, with your when when you left the floor, was this long before it officially shut down, or did you leave when it was shutting down? Well, I left the floor officially. Well, I guess well, I moved to Florida in 2010, and so at that time, it was, I would say, after 2008, 2009, it had dramatically dropped off. It had become really primarily electronic, 
I mean, mm-hmm. prior to 2008 and nine, well, global financial crisis was 2008, seven, eight. There was still a lot of what we called ARB. So you can be in the pit. And I did the ARB for a while where I had a guy on the other end from me and he was in the pit and I was electronic and he would bid an offer in the pit and I would offset them electronically or I'd get in electronically and offset them in the pit. And so that was very dominant at that time uh, for, there was a lot of people doing that. And that's really to me, what got the mini, the e-mini really, really big in terms of volume was Mm -hmm. the ability for some of these guys to step into the pit and take on a lot of size contract size and to be able to offset that immediately on the electronic platform. And so therefore you had this real tug of war of who was really leading at that time, because prior to that electronic trading was like trying to overtake the pit, but then electronic trading really did overtake it in 2009 and 2010. And so I had stopped doing the ARB in like 2010, 2011, uh, right around then. And so I'd moved down here to Florida. And, And at that point I looked at it as, The floor wasn't technically closed. I know that was your question, but it was to the point where there was no need for me to look into the floor anymore. There was no reason for me to have, a lot of people had squawks. I didn't need it anymore because we moved before they did. Before it was guys in the pit bidding and offering, and then the mini would react to that. When that, when that script flipped, you know, the writing was on the wall at that point, it was pretty much done. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. When it officially shut down, was it a day that you remember exactly where you were in Florida, the day the mark, the floor shut down, or was it not that big of an event for you? Well, there was actually a New York times article. I got called and I'd have to see if I, I actually still have the newspaper from when I was in it, but they were talking about how the floor was closing. And, and that wasn't really technically the the end end of it, because the floor did last, I would say until, I don't know the exact date. I think really COVID is what took off all pitch rating uh, at CME, but it was just one of these things. It was a process. I mean, it's just not so easy just to remove something that's got a hundred plus years of history, you know, and you have people that are members. I was a member of the exchange for 20 something years. I actually recently got rid of my seats. I just not using them as much anymore. I'm not nearly as active as a day trader to where it matters to me. And I'm also trading across all different markets now. So, I mean, a quick thing about membership is your your membership is based upon where you are on the floor. So if you're in options, you needed an IOM, which included S&P and NASDAQ. And then if you were in the euros, you can trade. If you're in the euro options, you needed an IOM. But if you were in the euro dollars and, or any other currencies, you needed an IMM. And so there was different things that you needed. So I was a member for an IOM and I had seats there and then I go to trade euros, I have to pay full commission. And that's the the, the membership benefit is you get a discount. And so when I started trading multiple different products and I wasn't day trading as much every day, you get rid of it. And I think a lot of guys have. And so it's just one of those things where it just kind of just slowly depleted. And I think until they could just finally said goodbye. And that was it. Mm, fascinating. It's just like a different world. And it really is kind of the end of an era seeing a, what the, what the process is for getting started now in trading and and yeah. uh, you know how open it is when you were making the transition was it pretty dramatic going from you know kind of going in every day to to not or did you when you did make the transition out did you transition into other groups of people or did you just go solo off on your own you know it's weird i've had a few transitions there one is i started trading in the pit and that was not great for me because it goes back to kind of your initial question, like how can you, how easy is it to become a member? How easy is it to get into that spot? Well, I got into that spot. I don't think it was really too difficult. I mean, I was a young guy when I went through membership, I was 20 years old and mm. you know, I got in when I was 21, took a little time, but it was really just difficult to make money because of, I don't want to use the word political, but it is kind of like that because unless you were six 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 five. And I I mean, I literally remember standing in the pit in front of, you know, a bunch of my buddies and I would literally be, if I was on the same step as them, I'd be at the middle of their chest and I'm just under six feet. So I'm 5'11 and I was like a shrimp in there, you know? So it's like, I have really, unless that broker is really interested in trading with me, I'm turning around and it's just like a sea of jackets. And so it, it was just very difficult for me. So my transition to electronic was actually very easy decision for me because I moved electronically very early on in the late nineties, because that was the only place I could actually get orders done. So that was like, okay, now there was me and a small group of us trading electronically one transition. 
that one I took a lot of heat for because everyone on the floor was still like, what are you doing in there, man? Like you're an idiot. I mean, I remember going to my mentor being like, listen, I'm struggling, man. I need to borrow money. And he's like, what are you doing out there in the freaking computer? You know what I mean? We're all making millions in here and you're losing your ass over there. I said, well, I come in there, I lose. I can't control it in the pit because nobody trades with me to get out. But I come in here, at least I can click in and click out. And so one transition and as time went by, I know I'm getting to your question about transitions, but I think it's important to see like there was a lot of transitions at the Merck because from that point, then it became like guys like me doing the ARB electronic with pit guys. And then the pit guys that weren't on the headsets were like, what's the matter with you guys? You know, you're ruining our business, you know? Uh, and then you go from the transition of, okay, now the pit guys are really trying to, some of them are turning electronic and the, the remaining pit guys are like, you know, what's happening here. Right. And so for me, because I went electronic early, the later transitions were easy because I had already developed a routine to be electronic and to really just be on my own versus when you're in the pit, you know, there's camaraderie there. And I was, for me, it was more socially and it was more about like, you know, having mentors around you and surrounding cast of people that were in the same business of you can't really replace that. And so that transition, when I came here to Florida, when I left the floor, the only thing that was difficult about it is, is just nobody really understands you. You know, they, they look at you and it's like, what are you doing? You know, you're a trader, like you trade futures. It's like, what is that? Right. And so you have nobody around you really to bounce that off and you really become isolated. And I actually think that's one of the biggest challenges in today's world for, for new traders is because you're so isolated that you, you don't have that camaraderie around you. You don't have that relief of being like, man, I got totally screwed today or I suck, you know, and you get to vent that with somebody that's gone. And so that to me, it was not, it was difficult, but it was not as difficult because I was kind of already isolated when I went to electronic. But I think overall, when the, when the floor did go away or when I did leave, it was difficult because it's, it's leaving a brotherhood is the way more I would say it. Like I just, I didn't have the supporting cast in case something happened to me. And so that kind of scared me a little bit. Oh, for sure. And it's an interesting point where a lot of other fields that you could be involved with, like, you know, if you're a plumber, you go out there and plumb. You can talk about your work to people and they understand like, oh, this pipe burst or this happened at this house exactly. or what, you know, the price is going up and down like, and nobody, it's very hard to translate how exciting or how dramatic or how stressful that was, uh, you know, for people outside the screens, um, which is interesting. When you transitioned out of the, the floor, did you ever, uh, was it always home office after this or did you ever get into just a, an actual workspace um, separate from your house? Well, home office initially when I moved to Florida, uh, not for very long. I, I I always struggled at a home office. I've pretty much been in an office exclusively right now. I'm in an office. I have a studio here. Um, I will have like a little man cave right behind this. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, really trading at home, I know that that's what everyone's doing these days because they're there and it's like, why pay for the office, cut expenses and all that. For me, it's a mindset. When I come here, I don't have distractions. And I think that this business is filled with distractions and any way that I could remove them, what it costs for me for an office space is, you know, it's nothing in, in the scheme of, you know, uh, it's a, it's it's one trade, you know? So you look at it and you go, okay, why try to save that one trade when it really is probably costing me multiple trades? Because when you come here, you're hyper-focused. This is the job. And I think you do treat it differently. Like right now I'm standing. I have a stand-up desk here. At home, that was hard. You know, I had an office there. I did all of that, but it's just like, oh, what's going on there? You know, I've got dogs. Or my wife's like, listen, you know, <laughs> you know, something's there's just even if it's minimal, it's it takes you away. Here I do what I have to do. I see it, it's right in front of me. I execute when I leave. I also feel the sense of relief when I go home because it's not there. You know, my wife works at home and I tell her all the time, I said, it's so difficult to work at home because you go from your office to the living room and that's supposed to be, you know, an area where you're with your family and you relax and you're mentally just letting things go. That doesn't work that way with trading. It's just like, oh, the market moved on Twitter. Let me go look. See at home, I don't even, I don't even really do it. I do look at it on my phone. We all have got that slight addiction, but my true trading setup and where I do all my business is, is here. So I, you know, just, I think it's just better to be away from home. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, like you said, kind of being penny wise and pound foolish, not to just go ahead and get the space. And uh, it's, it's an interesting dynamic when you are home all the time, people mistake you just being present 
for the mis for the fact that you're available <laughs> and that you can you know be, be uh, bothered or uh, you know speak into it. So yeah, it's a it's an interesting thing. That's very it's fascinating to hear because yeah, I think most people have home offices and um, there is something too kind of about the energy and I think the stress of trading that does kind of just permeate <laughs> into an atmosphere at times. And uh, the idea exactly. of separating that from your home and your loved ones and shielding them from that uh, it's a really nice idea for sure. Okay, so can you walk us through, let's say, um, you know, a normal trading day from the time you get up to what it looks like before you leave the house, when you leave the house, what you do first when you get to the office, kind of what you do before the market opens up, what the trading day looks like for you, and then if you do any type of end of day ritual before you shut it all down? You know, it's changed lately. I'm doing a lot more stuff at night, and I'm getting myself more wrapped around what I'm looking at coming into the morning. You know, last night was actually one of the rare nights I actually did a trade from home and I did a crude oil trade. I started the position because the market closed in an area that I thought was of interest to me. So I initiated the position there from my laptop. And so I like to look at the markets that closes because kind of what I've mentioned, I really, I'm trying to dedicate a majority of my energy and time towards the swing trading. I mean, the investment side is different because I have different investments and I have my own stock account, you know, some where it's, I'm I'm not touching and somewhere I'm somewhat active in. And so the investment side is like it's it's passive, right? If you want to call it that, even though I'm still actively looking at it. The 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 swing trading side, a lot of it comes after what happens at the end of the day. And I feel like that's got me into such of a better framework and and stronger hands in the markets because it's allowed me to let days set up and coming in the next day and I know what direction I'm looking for. So it starts really at night for me now. When the end of the day comes, I'll take a look at it and go, wow, that was interesting. I saw that, right? And because a lot of times I'm not trading middle of the day to the end of the day. It depends. If we're really busy, yeah. Um, or if I'm busy, I'm not, right? So it's just, it's dependent. But at the end of the day, it's where it starts because I can see things like how are markets closing? How are things going into the overnight? What did the market do to you know, the news the other day with, you know, it happened with, with Saudi Arabia and OPEC cuts and all these different things. Like, okay, what happened there? And you can look at it and you digest it. And when you come in the morning, I like to primarily do my trading within the first couple of hours. And so that's where I'll start initiating positions, working my stops, knowing where I'm at. And at that point, I'll identify if it's a day trading type day or not. Mm. You know, day trading really almost has to force me into want to do it because I don't really want to. And I think that actually helps me because the fact that I don't want to, it allows me to not do something, not to force something. So the overnight is like, okay, this is what happened. Come in in the morning. I wake up in the morning and my morning routine is very simple. I eat very light when I'm trading because I I found that I get sluggish. So I'm, I'm not a big eater during the day. It's almost really almost like a keto, you would say. You know, I wake up in the morning. I have a cup of coffee, basically usually a bulletproof, something like that. Hmm. Read get myself situated, see what's happening at my house, right? You know, all of the markets. Then I get in the car and I leave. 99.9%, .9%, maybe not that high, but a high percentage, I'm not executing at that moment. I get to the office, I sit down here. Uh, sometimes, some mornings I'll work out before I come if I see nothing. Some mornings I'll come straight here because I'm like, okay, I want to be there for the open. Watch the open, then the day kind of presents itself. Now, mind you, I'm already knowing where I'm looking more biased of direction. So now I'm looking to see confirmation in the morning. Does the morning uh, on the open give me something that says this is a day trading opportunity or is this more of something that you're leaning on the swing side? Uh, and, and then I make that execution based upon what happens after that I get that information. Very interesting. Do you feel that there is like a certain intangible about creating an idea, having a bias, and then separating yourself from the market, having that overnight time, almost that it kind of just percolates in the head a little bit? Do you, do you feel that way? Yeah, I do. Because like this morning, like yesterday, I initiated the crew position. I put on a small start. I like to start all my swing positions small because... Most of the time they go against you, right? They're never just that clean. So you get in, I wake up in the morning, I see it's against me and it's like, oh, it's a small position. But at that time I thought about it overnight. I'm like, look at, you know, it's already had a big move. You just kind of like wrapping your head around what your thought process is. You come in and the mornings give you confirmation because that's the ring of the bell. That's when the energy is there and that's when the volatility is going to hit. And so at that moment, I look for confirmation in my ideas and it allows me to really just be a better executor of my thought process. But I've had some time to let it simmer. 
you know, mm. in the past, what I would do is I would only come in the morning, see what's happening in the morning after I'd read a little bit, check out the markets. And it was all about, you know, the, the, the open, right? And so I've just gotten away from that because it's just not every day is that great. And not every day do I want to be physically and mentally 100% dedicated to it. Because I think that's the other thing is that a lot of people say, well, I'm trading part-time or I'm doing this while I'm doing that. If I have something else to do, it's hard for me to trade because if I trade for even 30 minutes in the morning and it's it's a crap day, that almost spills into the rest of my day. You're thinking about it. You lost a little bit or you made a little bit and you're like, oh my, what am I doing? And so it's like, I'm always, it it, it throws me off. And, and I have other businesses. I have other things that I'm looking at. It's like, dude, when you're ready to be a hundred percent, if it's a great day, then everything else is secondary. But unless that happens, you know, it's it's just not that often anymore, you know. And so I look at it and say, be patient, man. You know how to, you know, it took me years to really develop a swing trading mindset because from a short-term scalper to a swing trader, it's difficult because now I'm holding positions. Like right now I have a position on it. It's like, I could say a few, several years ago, it'd be hard for me to be here. I'd have a chart up right now. I don't have a chart up because I'm in a position and I want to be in it. And either you decide you want to do it or you don't. Right. In swing trading, you really have to be that way versus a day trader because when you come in based off the morning, you're just you're doing stuff. I'm buying, I'm sold. You know, you you're you're active, your 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 energy is all geared towards that. And it could be draining, even if you know you're winning. And so I've really tried to slow things down and be able to come in with that mindset of what did you see when nothing was really going on, when you didn't have a position on? What's it confirming with you today? And if it forces me to do something more aggressively or more intraday, I do it. But it's got to be situational. I want to take a quick break from the episode to talk to you about Tradeac. If you're on the trading journey and if you're really about this life, you know that it's not easy. And if you're feeling lost in your trading, maybe you're not getting the results that you want. Maybe you're lost and you don't even know if you're doing the right things and if you're heading in the right direction. Don't worry, Tradeac's here to help. From our flagship product, the Profile Method, all the way to our entry-level product, the Profile Formula, there's going to be something for everybody, regardless of where you're at in the trading journey. TradeAct is my company that I help start. All of the content that I create, all of the trading that I do, it happens right inside of TradeAct. So if you're ready to take your trading to the next level, click the link below. You can get started today. Now let's get back to the episode. It is wild how the markets, if left unchecked, will take everything from you. It will take all your money, but it will take your energy to a totally. point, like you said, where you can get to the end of a trading day and you just got nothing left. You nothing. can't do anything creative. You, you, you're just spent. And it's a very unique thing that I think is on all of us as traders to start to understand this. And this is something I've been working on because I just recognize that at some level, regardless of what the PL looks like, even on good trading days, I'm just, you know, I can get just really wiped out to where nothing else happens after that. And to, to learn how to protect that energy and to learn to be careful with it of how much you're going to let the market take from you in that sense, because it will take everything you give it. Uh, that, that's a very wise word that you said there. Very interesting. When you were talking about in the morning uh, reading before you leave the house, uh, is that a particular book or like a, a, a particular Bible or something? Or what, what do you read in the morning? Well, I like to read mostly news. So mm -hmm. I'm mostly reading news. I'm not reading books. Sometimes I am but it's, it's not as often. I like to read the news in the morning because I like to get a sense of what is the mood, mm. what is being put out there. You know, what are people reacting to what happened overnight or yesterday, or what are people saying about the day? And I like to read before I even almost look at what's happening in the market, because it's interesting that a lot of times you'll see what's put out on social media. You'll see articles that are pushed through the major publications, all these things will, will set a tone that maybe isn't represented in the market. And that's information, right? Mm -hmm. And so from that standpoint, I look and see, is it feeding what's happening? Is it contradicting it? Like, where are we with it? And that's mm -hmm. why I like to read the news because it gives me that sense of, and my one buddy taught me this. He's like, stupid news, right? And he's talking about it more from a data standpoint. If news comes out, and the market acts irrationally to it. And you're looking at that and, and you know, and I'm not a macro person, right? I'm not a macro trader, but I do understand it. And I look at it and I say, that's kind of ridiculous what's happening there. Mm -hmm. Or why did that not happen there? Mm -hmm. That's kind of strange. 
And he would literally take trades based upon that. And that taught me something as a trader. I said, man, you know what? That makes a lot of sense because when I look at it from that perspective, because people, most people want to be told what to do. Or a lot of times the media or social media sets the tone really behind the scenes for the trader. So they're kind of behind there kind of saying, look it, you know, you see a lot of talk lately about NVIDIA. I don't trade NVIDIA. I used to own it. I don't. I still wish I had it, maybe. I mean, we'll see, right? But the point of it is, is that it's feeding a narrative that NVIDIA's got issues when it's like this number one stock right now in the NASDAQ. And I look at that and I say, is, is price reflecting that? Will it someday reflect that? Is there a trade there? And so I look at that and I say, what, what is it telling me about that market? And you could say the same thing about crude oil right now that I'm looking at it. Crude oil's got bullish fundamental news whatever, right? I'm not going to hear and talk about what that news is or whatever. That's the, But I look at it and I say, okay, that that is probably bullish. Is the price reflecting it? Is the market doing what I, what I think it should be doing for this? If it is, then that's really telling us a lot. Like you don't want to fade that move, yeah. right? If, if crude oil comes in down big today and I look at it and go, wow, Maybe that capitulated, but if it comes in down a little and it stabilizes and starts to go up, it's like everybody that didn't participate in the rally is trying to fade the rally. And to me, that just gives it more gas, more steam. And so it gives you a different perspective when you read the news first, before you look at the market, because you see if the narrative or what's being pushed out there fits the day. Hmm. You know, just as a side note, I really appreciate your answers. And I think that you might not understand it, or maybe you do, but just hearing you speak, there's just this wisdom in your words that's coming across and it's really enjoyable just to hear you talk can i ask you this you talk about crude oil a lot have you ever thought about kind of rebranding yourself or does anybody ever call you anthony crude oil ellie <laughs> you know, it's so funny because my last name has crude in it and i really didn't trade crude for the first 10 years of my career i probably never even barely even looked at it i only traded s p but it, it, I, this has been asked to me several times before, like, why <laughs> you have crude in your name? People thought that I made, uh, several people have thought this, that I made up like that name because the word crude is in it. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, it's it's really, I did not, um, I did not do that. So it's really kind of a funny question because I have gotten that from people that have met me throughout the years. They're like, so why did you ask, add that name Crudelli? Like, you know, that's kind of strange. Yeah. No, I almost I almost started off by addressing you like that. And I thought, we're not close enough yet. This is our first time meeting. I better just <laughs> use his name. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll feel it out and maybe next time I'll tell him that. Okay. Can I ask you this? Let's say you're involved with uh, you know, quite a few different things as far as the investments, the swing trading, the regular trading, different markets, maybe options, maybe futures. Uh, if you had to look at one blank chart and on that chart, you could put one product you could put one time frame and you could put one indicator or tool. How would you set that up? No, it's it's so easy for me. It would be the E mini S and P daily with Bollinger Bands. Mm, interesting. You know, something I think that's very interesting is um, what is your thought process or what is your relationship to indicators in in general? Are they an active part of your analysis? Or are they an active part of your your actual trade ideas? Well, yeah, I mean they're a huge part of what I do because why I like indicators so much is because it's proof. It proves me something. What, what did the market do based upon this, the information you got from this indicator? Let's talk about you know an indicator I use a lot. And it actually came to me later in my career, and I, and I credit Brian Shannon for this, Alpha Trends. He's a friend of mine, and he brought this really more to my attention later in my career, and it's something I use regularly. It's the Anchored View app. Volume weighted average price. For years, I used moving averages alongside Bollinger Bands. I would use some MACD, some RSI, and and I would use I would use I would always use order flow, like cumulative delta, but I never really used a, a VWAP. So what's great about a VWAP is, and the reason why indicators are so important to me, like like a VWAP, where are we relative to volume weighted average price? And it proves to me if it's above it that the market is stronger than the volume weighted average price. And I know that sounds so stupid simple, right? But mentally, I look at that and say, the market is giving me an indication that it's holding above volume weighted average price. And so it means something to me. It means to me that the market is outperforming the volume weighted average price. And so I've learned in my career that 
you want to be long strength. You want to be short weakness. And I know a lot of people will say, well, buy the dip in stocks. That's totally different. In my portfolio long-term, I try to buy some weak stocks because I know I'm going to have a wider stop. I'm going to keep them. It's a totally different mindset. It's not the same as an investment as it is for a trade. With a trade, I try to go with the outperformance or the underperformance. And so therefore, indicators help me identify that. Why I like Bollinger Bands? Bollinger Bands show you if volatility is expanding or contracting. If volatility is contracting, it's a two-way tape. Bollinger Bands are coming in. It's a two-way tape. You're looking at mean reversion. When Bollinger Bands are open and markets are going you know, in one direction, volume is expanding. And so in my mind, why would I want to step in front of a trade that's above a VWAP with a mouth of the Bollinger Band going open? I only want to be with that trade, right? And then you add another indicator like an RSI or a MACD. What is the momentum telling me? Is it overbought? Is it oversold? Can we get near overbought? How long have we been overbought? And so the information there tells me what's happening in the market. And so indicators, they help me understand the environment and they keep me from doing things against trends and they keep me from doing things, or they actually should rephrase that, they keep me from doing things against what's working and they help me put myself into trades that are working. This is fascinating to, to hear from you. Can I ask you, how many indicators do you typically look at? Like if you have a chart that's set up exactly what you want for crude oil, um, how many indicators do you have on that chart? So at night, it's simple. It's uh, usually daily. I'll look at the dailies every day and I'll look at them with a beer, uh, Bollinger Band 20 period, three standard deviation. I like a five-day moving average. I'll sometimes look at a 10-day. It just depends on how volatile we are and how strong a trend is. If a market's back and forth within trend, like there, if there's more volatility and it's not really indicating much to me, uh, then I'll go to a five-day because I'd rather hold myself against that than a 10-day. So that's really deciding that. Then I look at uh, and RSI is what I've been using now for years. I use MACD. I move more to the RSI. I think they're very similar in indicators. You want to look at overbought or oversold. Oversold, you could lose st use stochastics. It's just representation of overbought or oversold momentum. That's all I look at on the daily. Then you get to intraday. It's different. Well, intraday every morning when I come in, I have a three minute chart up. I have an anchored VWAP to the regular trading hours open. I have three standard deviation lines around an anchored VWAP that's anchored to the opening three minute. And I look at that below that I have cumulative delta. So I want to see what is the net buying and selling of the day for whatever market that I'm watching. Uh, and then I'll also have a chart above that that I'll look at, which is a 60 minute chart, which gives me the medium term perspective of what's happening in the market. My daily has already told me what I want. Once again, I come in knowing what's the daily telling me. Yesterday I said, bullish, crude oil, you know, S&P, mean reversion, maybe it could pull back. We'll see. There's a lot of room in the middle of the chart. We're just in the middle of a range. Pull them back into August. Okay. You come in, you look at the 60 minute. Yeah, it's telling me that. Oh, look at this on crude. Oh, what's happening with order flow delta? There you go. I mean, so it's a top down approach. Most people do it. It's nothing that creative or that new, but I stay true to it. And I think that's the key, you know, is that oh, at night, I don't look at too much. I just want to see what's the market environment on the daily. What is it? You only can come to what really one, well, you can come to three conclusions sideways, bullish, bearish. That's it. And so it's really simple. When I come in the morning, what's it showing me for the day? If the day is coinciding with the overnight or with the bigger picture and the medium term is, is also coinciding with it, that's a great day-to-day -day trade because you got one side, one thought process. You're like, boom, trade that puppy, right? If they're conflicting, you're not sure, you know, is there anything on the swing? Probably not. You're done. Fascinating. Would you say... That the I would be under the impression I'd be interested if you would agree with this or not that when it comes to indicators, most traders are abusing them in the sense that they're not having these top-down approaches. They're not using these indicators to try and get a sense of what the context is and what the story is and how they can put together ideas. But they're using them to more blindly tell them where to enter, and that's kind of their trading experience is looking at these indicators and looking for entries is is basically you know what they're doing. Do you um, agree with that sentiment? And do you think that there's a danger there? And if you're using an indicator strictly just chasing around entries, this is a, a bad use of an indicator? I just think that most traders have redundancy in their chart. They have an indicator that's doing the same thing, right? That they'll, they'll have 
a lot of the same type of indicators, multiple momentum, multiple type of order flow tools, and they're looking for too much versus I think that, and you use the word really like, uh, do you say the word abused or the, the way that they're doing it or they're that something like that? Probably. Yeah. It's, it's the, the reality is, is that most new traders are just, they're searching. And, and the problem with that is that when you search for things, you're going to find something, but you may not find the, the right answers. Right. And so I look at indicators as proof to me. I like very simple. Do I want to be long? Do I want to be short? The rest comes down to execution. And I know some people will agree, disagree with me on this, but I think that there's a lot of different ways to make money in this business. I think there's a lot of different strategies. A lot of people will tell you that their strategy is, this is, this is the best, right? Or whatever, right? But I've been around long enough to know that if I see a good trader, it doesn't really matter what strategy that they trade. They're going to find a way to make money. Some people are just bad traders. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's just reality. They're always searching for something. Their mind's somewhere else. They never could just hone in, look at the market and go, look, I want to be long. The market's telling me to be long. What's the best way for me to execute this? Then you put in indicators and that's when strategy just, you know, you start getting understanding what another one of my mentors taught me, context and nuance, what's happening in the day. You know, do you want to have a wider stop? Do you want to be more aggressive here at this price? What's going on around you? That's where the real trader comes in. I mean, the actual strategy itself, and I always say this, if you have a great strategy, if this strategy is so good, automate it, just automate it. Tell me how good it is, show it to me, I'll give you money. Because the reality is if you really wanna be a great trader, the strategy matters a lot, don't get me wrong. Hmm. But back to the new question or the question about how new traders are just abusing their charts or they're just, they're not using them in the right way, it's because they're searching. They're not being forced in and there's a difference. I am someone who loves to trade. I'm an over trader by nature. I love to be in the market. You never needed to force me in. I had health issues. Financially, I gave back a ton of money, sucked. You know, I've done so many stupid things to put myself in bad positions. I don't want to go back there. Mm. Make me do it because I want to make money and I don't want to put myself through the physical pain and mental pain of forcing things all the time. I still have to fight this to this day. That's why I put in structure. Because if I don't, I'm going to overtrade. I'm going to screw it up because that's the type of person I am. I want to be in. I want to do it. I want to be active. Slow it down, man. Get something proved to you. Look at the direction. If you like the direction, trade it. You'll find a way to become a great executor. If you find a strategy that you believe in, you're confident in, and it gives you that direction. One of the biggest things before I stop here is mm. don't look at too many directions intraday. It's a kiss of death. Mm. When you're looking at the market and you're sitting down to trade, do you have an overall kind of worldview? Like maybe you look at this as a you know financial war that's dangerous and everybody's trying to kill each other. Or do you look at this like an art and you're an artist coming in trying to paint a beautiful picture? Or do you have like an underlying kind of view of the market this way? You know, it's funny you ask this. I've never been asked this question. You're like, how do I view it in general? You know. It's funny. I'll talk my way through this because I don't really have an answer right now. And part of this is, like I, like I see people bickering on Twitter about who's right or who's wrong. And I always look at it as like, man, I, don't, I really don't care. I, mm -hmm. I don't put myself through trying to be right. And, you know, like I said, NVIDIA right now, everyone's talking about that or S&P's in a bear market. Oh, no, we're in a bull market. I, I mean, I always look at it as I don't really care about that stuff. I mean, I do in some ways. But really, when it comes down to it, I spend so little time thinking about those things that, you know, I see these YouTube, uh, you know, guys putting stuff on YouTube with like, you know, fires coming up, the world's burning, right? Or this is happening, you know, the Fed is about to ruin your life, or this is the most important CPI of your lifetime. And I'm always like, okay, I mean, at the end of the day, I think when you do this long enough, you just look at it like this. We're not out here solving world problems. What we're trying to do is we're trying to we're trying to make money as traders. You know, we're here because we're we are capitalists. We want to come in. We want to be in business for ourselves. Most of us are really hard workers. We've got dedication. You know, and most of us are good people. Like we come in and we just want to go out there and we want to make a buck. And so I look at it as if I look at it in, in a divisive way, it doesn't make me feel good about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Like, I like this business. I love it. I fought to stay in it. 
at the beginning of my career, I fight to stay in it today. I, I, I look at it more as a challenge for me and myself. How disciplined am, am I in what I want to do? How good can I be? You know, and, and I look at it more as a challenge for me to, to compete than, than anything. I don't look at the market as any sort of evil thing. I look at the market as opportunity. Hmm. That's a great answer. You've referenced social media several times. Um, do you, if you were to think about it, do you think social media is a net positive or a net negative for new traders? Oh, it's a net positive for sure. But once again, you got to be smart enough to see behind what's really happening there. Remember, you know, Twitter now is sending people money for however many views it is. I don't even know. Um, you know, YouTube, all of the money that people make on YouTube, you get these people that have got huge YouTube followings, you know, they're, they're making money from that. So they're trying to provide content for that, right? I'm in the podcasting business. I get it. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm totally getting it. You and I both, we want as many views as we can. doesn't mean that everything that you and I do is going to help these traders, right? We want to think it is, but you got to understand as a trader, and this is at the top of my uh, Twitter page, trading is a journey of oneself. The reason why I am not a coach, I am not um, someone who is has a subscription and does that because, look, I've tried it in the past. I've done some of it. And I mean, this was years ago. I tried it. I tried it for a short period of time. And I'm like, man, I am just, this is just like, you know, it, it pained me more when somebody else lost versus when, you know, they, they if they pay me money to help them, I'm like, man, look, because I realized that I sat down next to people and I traded next to people and I lost money doing the same thing they did. Or people sit down next to me trading the same way I did and lost money. And when I made money, and you're like, well, what happened there? And so getting back to the social media problem is, is that social media is all about sparkle and, and, and it's all about getting people to believe in uh, that, that it's whether it's easier or this, this, this dream that these people are living these dream lives. And I've been trained for 25 years. Let me tell you something. I am blessed, but it has not been a dream. <laughs> There's been a lot of things I've had to go through. I've had a heart attack. I've had, you know, stomach issues. I've had, you know, things with friends. I mean, the list can go on. It's, it's nothing about this has been like, oh, you know, super easy. And I think mm -hmm. it's made me more into the person that I am today that I can see social media and say, okay, sure, buddy. Okay. I get it. Yeah. All right. Sure. We'll see where you are in six months, let alone six years from now. I've seen it. I've seen guys die. I've seen people go broke that had 10, $20 million. I've seen it. And so these people on social media, these new traders, they see sparkle. They see that people are doing this and this is a great life. Look at trading is a great life, but it's a very difficult life. And you're going to have a lot of heartbreak. You're going to have a lot of pain. It's not going to be linear. It's just not. And so I think that hurts them. But at the same token, if they could take something from you, something from me, something from a lot of these other people that are putting out a lot of great content and they could see between it and they're smart enough and they could pull it, then this is the best education time in our history because there's so much out there. But you've got to be smart enough to see through it. Mm, a lot of wisdom. A lot of wisdom in those words. Let me ask you this. When it comes to trading and maybe longevity in the space, you've talked about the difficulty of it and everything. And I'm cautious the way I ask this because I don't want to imply that I think you're getting to a point where you need to. But do you have thoughts about when it's time to hang up the mouse and just enjoy another season of your life? Or do you plan, is it kind of your thought process that, that you're just going to do this and die at the keyboard? Or what are your thoughts on uh, the end of a trading career? Well, for me, it's different because I had a heart attack at 36 years old. I'm now 46, so I'm 10 years removed from it. And my heart attack wasn't uh, cardiovascular disease. I didn't have a blockage. They didn't give me you know, a stent. They didn't do anything for me. They gave me medication. I went home in three days. Mine was a stress-induced heart attack. So my life changed at that moment. I, I want to see... 56, 70, 66, you know, I want to see every, every decade, you know, and I look at that moment and I, I started diversifying myself, started podcasting. I've got, you know, a production company, I've got investments in other things, 
So for me, trading has become, it's still the center point of my life. Even when I was looking at my tax statement the other day, it said trader on it. I was looking at that and I'm like, man, I've got a lot of things going on. I am not just that anymore, which is great for me because I have, it took me and it's still going to take me a lot of years to do what I feel like I want to do in this industry, but it's not just all financial, but it's, it's, it's one of those things where I look at it and go, it's the center point because everything I do around it is because of what I did there. You know, a lot of the money that I made from this, I've moved to other places. I've done other different things in order to have longevity in that central focus point. Because part of me feels if I would have just stayed trading at the age of 36 after my heart attack, would I have had another heart attack? Would something else physically could have happened to me? Could it have been other health problems? I don't know. And and the reality is I put so much pressure on myself to perform. I think that anybody that does this puts an immense amount of pressure on themselves to perform. And it's just too difficult to do for too long. I mean, the question is, you know, when do I know to hang it up? The, the goal is to build my life to where around to when I hang it up, when I just feel like I just don't even want to trade. And that, that may be never, but it's not going to be the market's decision it's going to be my decision and i think that that's that's the one of the most difficult things for me to get over when i had a heart attack and what do i mean by the market's decision versus mine because if i would have stayed on a path of pressure um packed constantly trying to you know make more and more all the time just from trading i probably have another heart attack market mm-hmm. maybe does take me down now my mindset is i exist keep doing what you're doing make money. I always say to myself, make, make money, dummy. You know, like, what are you doing here? Right. And it's like, and that has actually brought a whole new stage of my career where like I come in and it's like, man, I'm doing pretty good for not having the pressure that I did it before. And before when I was pressuring myself and I'd actually had made a lot of money and I started giving a lot of money back. And when that happens, I just, I couldn't take it as a person, right? Because mm. you just, you're just so frustrated. You're just like, unbelievable. How could I have made millions of dollars? And now I literally wake up, I can't make 500 bucks. It's so mm. unbelievably frustrating. Mm. And it just got to me. But you get to the point now where it's like, now I've built this businesses and other things where it's like, I come in, I'm in control. I don't need to feel that way anymore. If I have a great month, like August was a good month for me, one of my best months of the year. I didn't force anything. I just want to exist in this business. And this is the way I really think. So I can keep doing it because I love it. And so when it becomes not fun for me or something changes in my life, I'll decide that it doesn't make sense, but I won't let the market do it to me. Mm. You know, it's interesting how I don't think enough conversation happens around when things are going wrong. And I think it's usually in life and in markets, when things are going well, they tend to take kind of take care of themselves. But it it matters very little how well things go to when when things go bad if you can't protect yourself. And I think possibly the most discouraging thing that happens in life is when you start to break through some barriers and you start to see like a certain level of progress in your life. And when you reach a certain peak and then that whole thing crashes down, it's a very interesting life experience. And I think the scale that you just described was very large. And I think at a smaller scale, I've lived through these things and, and we all do of kind of pushing ourselves to get better and and not being able to hold on to it, you know, uh, before it all almost kind of ebbs and flows against us. But is it, yeah, it's interesting. I related a lot to what you just said there. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Through the uh, years that you've been in the markets, a lot has changed. But from your perspective, is it kind of just cyclical, things are coming, things are going? Or, or from your perspective, is the market and the action that we're seeing radically different than it used to be? Or is this like a different version of the same thing to you? Yeah. I just think that there's, there, first of all, I would say that the markets themselves are always going to have similarities and foundational roots from when the market started, however many long, uh, how many years ago, right? hundred plus years ago, or even longer, really hundreds of years ago when it comes to trade. And I think that the reason why those roots, those fundamental roots will will always be there is because it's people. People build the AI, people build the algo, people build the HFT. And what happens is they compete through technology. But at the end of the day, the, the human being behind it 
and, and the way that the markets move is all still based upon, in my opinion, human reaction. And that's what I think is no matter what happens in this business, there's always an opportunity for a day trader because machines will take things too far. They won't take things far enough. There will be certain things that they'll look at and you'll see it in, in real time and be like, I don't, that, does, that, does, that doesn't make sense, right? And there will be times for us to take advantage of it. And so I think that the market's constantly changing. It's just the tools behind the human, right? Because when I first started, pit only, electronic came in, pit looked at electro or electronic looked at pit. Then it was ARB. We were trading pretty equal. Then it was Pitt looking at electronic. Then Pitt goes away. Electronic has ALGOs, HFTs, the race for speed, right? I, I can't remember how fast they were saying they were getting uh, filled. And that war is basically they carnage themselves down to where there's few players in that space, right? And then it's uh, AI now, right? AI. At what point does that, you know, take its toll to where it's, you know, something new that we don't know about comes into the marketplace, but what ultimately stays is people, there's traders, you know, I mean, there's, I think that's why you need us as market makers and we're not class, you know, technically market makers out there, but we're going to go out there and make a market for something that we think doesn't make sense. And, you know, I think that's, I think that doesn't ever go away. I just think that there's going to be different times where things are going to come in and they're going to run the, they're going to they're going to run it for a while that's just the way it is i mean i've just seen it too many times to say well what's next i don't know you know and so i mean there was a time just another one like i remember in 2008 i'm only looking at i paid a guy to sit at a bloomberg and to read the news to me all day long never forget it shout out to mikesh and he would sit there and we would and i'd be like what happened what happened and everything mattered then now news comes out the market it's just it, it, it's it's I can't even beat them as fast as they react. And a lot of times I'm taking the opposite side of it because it took it too far or what have you. So it's just, it's always changing. And as people, we just got to be smart enough. And I will say this, the people that are smart enough to see through it and to understand and to embrace some change and to understand some things never change, those are the ones that keep going. Hmm. Anthony, if I could tell you, it has been um, a real pleasure just to hear your talk and to get to know you at some level. And you have one of the best spirits about you of uh, not, I'll just say not even as traders, but just as people. And it was, uh, I feel my spirit has been lifted just being around you. And there's a, a real energy that you give off, which is just fantastic. And uh, th this has been really, really great. I've taken a lot from this conversation and uh, I just want to thank you very much for the time. I, I know we're at the end of it. Um, we'll put everything in the description. Um, I'm a big fan of what you have going on with your podcast and with your even production. Um, on the way out, could you just tell people how they can find out more about what you're doing and, and where would be the best place to stay connected with you? Well, Aaron's the feelings mutual. I got to tell you, this was so much fun. You ask great questions. You're a fantastic host. And I know this podcast is going to be massively successful uh, with you at the, at the helm. So I wish you all the best with that. Uh, for people to come and find and learn more about me, just go to anthonycrudelli.com. Everything really feeds off of that. My Twitter is Anthony Crudelli. And I also have a uh, place called placeyourtrades.com. A lot of cool stuff there. Different podcasters. I'm also uh, a part of um, the morning production there. So we've got a lot of different stuff. Shy Girl, Cordova, AMB, PAX. So a lot of my good friends, they're all, um, all, all a part of Place Your Trade. So go and check that out as well. Very good. Well, we'll make sure those are linked into the description and I'll uh, I'll say a goodbye to you proper, but I'll stop the recording and we'll say goodbye to everybody here. So uh, once again, thanks for coming on and uh, goodbye. See you, everybody.